Coming up next, CityNet 30 takes you downtown for the weekly luncheon meeting of the City Club of Portland. Live weekly coverage of City Club is made possible in part by TCI and is produced through the facilities of Portland Cable Access. Now we join the City Club for this week's program. I welcome now Pete Heuser. Thank you. Fran, thank you very much, and thank you very much for serving us this past year. We've, uh, we've had a lot of things going on this year, as you know. We were faced with many challenges. Uh, one of the principal challenges was uh, our, our live broadcast. Fran dealt with that problem and led us through it, and now as a result of her efforts, we probably have more media cover coverage than we've ever had, with CityNet 30 particularly. She saw us through the change of venue from the Hilton Hotel over here to the Multnomah Club and was involved in negotiation to that contract, and we appreciate her doing that as well. But I think one of the things most of us will remember her by are her wonderful introductions and the humor, and she's just so comfortable at the mic. I'm not sure we've seen anybody so comfortable since Pauline Anderson was our president, <laughs> so we'll miss that, Fran. Fran, we know how into gardening you are and how you will enjoy that as you have a little more time on your hands. So the board members pitched together, and we got you a couple gardening implements. But Fran, uh, something else. We, you just seem so anxious to pass the torch. You see, so anxious to leave us behind. We thought we'd leave you with something that even when you were in your garden, you wouldn't be able to get away from us. We bought you a bush, a rhododendron bush. It'll be called the City Club rhododendron bush. So even in your garden, we'll be there with you. Now, we will plant it. We'll plant it using the composted manure that I have in a pile in my yard and the worm castings. And the board is going to be volunteering to help me. So we'll see how I am at delegating authority here to get, to get them to get their hands dirty. Um, thank you for electing me. Or actually, I guess I should thank you for not flooding the office with extra nominations or write-ins or that sort of thing. I appreciate your confidence in me. Uh, I want to encourage you, as Fran did, to provide us with your input. We're here for you. We're only in these positions for a short while, so we can work for you. If you have ideas of new things we should be doing, let us know. If you see things that we're not doing very well, let us know. If you think of ideas for programs, you could talk to Susan Deskamp or Steve Schneider. Or uh, if you have ideas of things we might research, talk to Jay Formick or uh, Nikki Lynch, or call me or call the staff. We want to hear from you. We want to do a job that you'll be proud of. We can't do that without your input. Now let's get on to today's program. Our board host today is Jay Formick. Executive Director of Oregon Heat. He'll be asking the first question. After Jay's question, of course, we'll open the audience to City Club members in the audience. Um, and uh, people ask your questions, please, in no longer than uh, 30 seconds. Our program today is made possible in part due to generous corporate underwriting by Legacy Health Systems, U.S. Bank, and the law firm of Miller, Nash, Wiener, Hager, and Carlson. They made my fundraising efforts very easy. Uh, the program may run over a bit today since we got a bit of a late start, so if you need to leave after uh, Dr. Druckmann's prepared remarks, you can do so, but I'm sure that many of you wanna, will want to stay for questions. Mason Druckmann received a PhD in political science from UC Berkeley. He, he served as a professor of political science in the University of California system and here in Portland at Reed College. He's an author of a, an earlier book, a book entitled Community and Purpose in America, published by McGraw-Hill. And he's recently had published this biography on Wayne Morse, which he'll be talking about today. I got a copy of the book earlier this week. And actually, I've made it through most of it. It's real interesting, and I, I commend it to you. 
One of the things I enjoyed most about the book is a discussion of the personal relationships which Wayne Morris had with other politicians. He, uh, uh, Dr. Druckmann really breathes life into these relationships through the way he tells stories and give, gives quotes. One of the things that struck me is, is when Wayne Morris was spending his day in, in the Senate arguing against any defense spending, spending as long as the war in Vietnam was going on, or when he was arguing against the Tonkin Gulf Resolution, he might spend that evening at the White House smoking cigars with Lyndon Johnson talking about their prize bulls. They were both cattlemen and this is something they shared together. Uh, uh, Mason in his book tells a story about how uh, President Johnson uh, m met with uh, the senator in the halls of Congress and said, said uh, you certainly are looking, are, are looking fit, uh, Senator Morris. I, I don't know what you do to keep yourself looking so good. And the quote in response was, Mr. President, I read in the papers about everything you've been doing in Vietnam. It makes my blood boil. It purges me. It keeps me fit. <laughs> so a lot of quotes like that that, that really liven it up. Um, but Dr. Druckmann points out in his book that it is this inattention to personal relationships that ultimately served as Senator Morris's undoing. Um, you may recall that in 1966, when Senator Morris was a Democrat, Bob Duncan was the Democratic nominee for uh, Oregon Senate. Uh, for, the, for the U.S. Senate from Oregon, Mark Hatfield in 1966 was the Republican nominee. Mark Hatfield, of course, was against the war. Bob Duncan was a hawk, even though he was a Democrat and in favor of it. And Wayne Morris came out in favor of Mark Hatfield, which was a big surprise to a lot of people, and certainly not to the enthusiastic support of the Democratic leaders in Oregon and elsewhere. It turned out that two years later, when Wayne Morris was running for Senate, he needed the help and support of a lot of Democrats who weren't there to provide it as a result of the earlier endorsement of Mark Hatfield. Later in the book, uh, Dr. Druckmann talks about uh, the City Club debate between uh, Morris and Packwood and uh, some anecdotal uh, uh, references to that. Uh, it, it brought to mind, in my mind, the Smith-Wyden debate that we had here a couple years ago that was so well attended and so uh, enjoyable to see. We've got some interesting debates uh, coming this fall as a part of the election season, but we won't talk about the future. Let's step back into the past and hear what Mason Druckmann has to say about Wayne Morse and the myth of maverick ineffectiveness. Mason Druckmann. Thank you, Peter, very much. I'll repeat the title, Wayne Morris and the Myth of Maverick Ineffectiveness. It speaks a little bit to some of the issues that Peter raised. Well, I'm enormously pleased to be here. Um, as some of you may remember, who are at least as old as I am, that uh, the Morris-Packwood debate took place 30 years ago, next October. Uh, a debate that may have turned the tide of the 68 election, one of the closest in Oregon history, in favor of Packwood. Probably none of you will remember that in the previous year, a woolly-headed Reed College professor named Mason Druckmann spoke before the City Club in an appearance that generated a fair amount of controversy. From my vantage point as a peace activist, and a political scientist at Reed, I was asked to explain the meaning of student protest in the 60s. I won't say I wasn't well received, but after the moderator thanked me at the end of a rather vigorous question period, he added, and these are his exact words, if I were you, I'd keep away from downtown dark alleys for the next few weeks. But I had an unexpected bonus from that talk. For some reason, the University of Oregon Dental School chose to reprint a version of my remarks in their house journal. The name of this journal was, and for all I know still is, Caimentum, C-A-E-M-E-N-T-U-M. -E -E well, because Caimentum had a kind of scholarly ring to it, I listed it thereafter on my academic resume as one of the periodicals in which I had published. 
Some years later, when I was interviewing for the chief editor's job at New Zealand's Consumers Institute, I was surprised to be asked what I knew about construction work. I must know something, the interviewer suggested, since one of my pieces had appeared in a magazine whose Latin name, Caimentum, means cement. <laughs> you get the cement in dental school. It took me a while. Fortunately, I had the wit to reply that Caimentum has nothing to do with construction. The journal, I said, has that name because it only accepts articles with concrete evidence. <laughs> of course, the interviewer gave me a funny look, but Kiwis tend to believe that all Yanks are a bit peculiar anyway. Well, as the title of my talk today suggests, I hope to dispel one of the more long-lasting myths about Wayne Morse. Before I do that, I want to provide you with a very brief outline of Morse's life. This is old news for some of you. Morse was born in Wisconsin in 1900. He obtained a BA and MA in speech at the University of Wisconsin and a law degree at the University of Minnesota. He was a professor of law and dean of the University of Oregon Law School throughout the 1930s. He was the leading labor arbitrator on the West Coast waterfront from the mid-1930s to the early 1940s. He served on the National War Labor Board during World War II. He was elected as a Republican to the U.S. Senate in 1944 in his very first try for political office. He was then reelected in 1950. He left the Republican Party in 1952 and served in the Senate as an independent for nearly three years. He was elected to the Senate as a Democrat in 1956, defeating former Governor Douglas McKay, and he won again when his seat was up in 1962. After 24 years in office, Morse was defeated by Packwood in 1968. He ran again in 72, but lost to incumbent Mark Hatfield. Morse was in the midst of a rematch against Packwood when he died in 1974. The myth I would like to look at is that Mavericks in general, and Wayne Morse in particular, are ineffective legislators. Because it is said they go their own way, regardless of, of legislative or constituent majorities, Mavericks fail to get anything done. They are outside the mainstream they not only lack influence, they lack respect. In doing research for my book, I read and heard this description of Morse time after time. I heard it again a few months ago when, while I was in Oregon, one of your current senators was quoted as saying, it would be foolish to follow in Morse's footsteps since Morse was never able to accomplish anything. Because of Morse's maverickness, and his aggressive personality, historian Stanley Carno has described him as the typhoid Mary of the Senate. And some of you may recall that in the 1968 campaign, and especially in the City Club debate, Packwood scored heavily by arguing that Morse didn't know how to play the game in Washington, and was therefore unable to promote the interests of his state as he should have. Well, I must acknowledge at the outset that like all myths, the Morse myth has some basis in reality. Because he went his own unpredictable direction on most issues, and because his independent stands were aggressively, often ferociously defended, Morse could irritate fellow legislators. And such irritation could sometimes last many years and cause him to lose cooperation from certain colleagues. We all know of Morse's maverick opposition to the Vietnam War, an opposition that dated back to 1954, 10 years before the infamous Gulf of Tonkin resolution that propelled America into the uh, conflict. 
But here are three examples taken from my biography of Morse, showing him exercising his quintessential maverickness in areas that had nothing to do with foreign policy. Example number one shows Morse refusing to keep silent in the face of what he saw as executive misbehavior on the domestic front. The year is 1957. Morse has just returned to Washington, having been reelected to the Senate for the first time as a Democrat. Also elected to another term, much to Morse's dismay, dismay is President Dwight D. Eisenhower. Appearing on Mike Wallace's ABC interview program in late May, it's amazing to think that this is a Mike Wallace had an interview program in May of 57. He'll outlive all of us, I think. <laughs> Morse describes Eisenhower's Hell's Canyon giveaway as equivalent to Teamster President Dave Beck's thievery of union finances. Morally speaking, he says, he cannot differentiate Eisenhower's granting the Idaho Power Company millions of interest-free taxpayer dollars to build dams on the Snake River from Beck's dipping into union member pockets in order to fill up his own. When outraged Republicans contend that if uttered within the walls of Congress, such pejorative remarks would subject their speech to disciplinary proceedings, Morris rushes to the Senate floor and repeats his assertion. <laughs> the charge of immorality is not all that new. Morris has been excoriating Eisenhower in similar language for years. But associating the president with an alleged felon like Beck is new, and it moves some Republicans to the highest of dudgeon. A furious Homer Capehart of Indiana declaims in the Senate that Morse is guilty of intellectual dishonesty. Iowa's Burke Hickenlooper characterizes Morse's statements as far more odious than anything Joe McCarthy ever said. I should note in passing that these were more delicate times. Uh, I mean, today, a member of Congress refers to the president as a scumbag, and it scarcely makes a dent in the, in the newspapers or the media. Along with others, Capehart argues that Morse, like McCarthy, should be formally censured by the Senate for what amounts to presidential character assassination. To the delight of the press, Morris refers to Capehart as, quote, a tub of rancid ignorance, <laughs> and dares him to introduce a resolution of censure. However, Republican managers decide it would be unprofitable to wage parliamentary warfare against the Senate's Stormy Petrel. Stormy Petrel is the metaphor of the Philadelphia Inquirer. They see to it that the matter is dropped. When asked why he and his colleagues backed away from a confrontation, Senator Alexander Wiley of Wisconsin replies, do you think I'm crazy? Only a bunch of jackasses would take Morse on. <laughs> Maverick examples number two and three show Morse calling into question the integrity of his own party's leadership as well as the leadership of the entire Senate. Now we move ahead five years to the spring of 1962. John F. Kennedy is president, Lyndon B. Johnson vice president. Morris will run for a fourth term in the autumn. Morris has been sitting through a long private meeting of Senate Democratic chieftains in which speaker after speaker agrees that the party should exercise caution in proceeding with the more controversial new frontier proposals they have before them, one of which is Medicare for the aged. Vice President Johnson, acting as Kennedy's emissary, sums up the session by saying, as I gather it, the consensus of this meeting is to advise the president that these measures should be laid over until the next Congress. At this, Morse, who has been listening in what is described as brooding silence, explodes, accusing his colleagues of stalling, pussyfooting, and backsliding while the American public is calling for action. According to one press report, 
Morse's blast leaves his fellow Democrats so startled that they are unable to offer, quote, a word in reply. Well, being stunned into silence by Morse's scolding may, in fact, have felt like a relief to colleagues driven to near shock by his earlier attack on a custom greatly cherished by both parties. And this is example number three. Without prior warning, Morse presented a resolution banning hard liquor in all public rooms of the Senate and in both Senate office buildings. To sharpen the point of his proposal, he timed its introduction to coincide exactly with a cocktail party for President Kennedy, being hosted by Majority Leader Mike Mansfield in the new Senate reception room. Morse, a lifelong teetotaler, had long been disgusted by the sight of drunken members staggering through the halls of Congress, and especially by the spectacle of legislators quaffing lobbyists' booze in quarters paid for by the public. At his behest, the Senate dining room menu had added the following offering, quote, Oregon's new fresh fruit dairy drink, compliments Senator Morse. No senator dared an open forum to oppose a call for sobriety, so the proposal was quickly moved to the Senate Rules Committee. There, behind closed doors, it was immediately postponed by unanimous vote. For the next several months, alcohol served under the Capitol Dome would be referred to as Morse water. As these examples suggest, Morse's maverickness could rankle his colleagues at various times. Does this mean, however, that by being a maverick, he lost standing or effectiveness in Congress? I began my investigation into this question by writing to former Democratic Wisconsin Senator William Proxmire and asking him what he thought of Carnot's typhoid Mary portrayal. In light of his history with Morse, anything Proxmire might say in Morse's favor must be given special weight. After beginning his congressional career as an ally of Morse, Proxmire fell out with him in a bitter dispute over labor legislation in the late 1950s, and the two were never on really friendly terms thereafter. Proxmire was, moreover, a consistent enemy of Morse on foreign policy one of President Johnson's most ardent supporters on Vietnam throughout the 1960s. These are Proxmire's words. The answer to your question on Stanley Carnot's evaluation of Morse is this. Wayne Morse was recognized during the years we served together, 1957 until he left the Senate, as having the ablest mind in the Senate. In my mind, he never lost his credibility or insight understanding or logic. Frequently he would take positions which contradicted the president or a majority of the Senate, but he would always argue his position with great force. On those occasions, many senators disagreed with Morse. Frequently a large majority disagreed with him. But most senators deeply respected the sincerity of his convictions. I soon learned just how many in Congress shared Proxmire's opinion. The truth is that for all his volatility, Morris was, contrary to myth, always a highly effective senator. With what seemed to be a limitless supply of energy, he was by all accounts the hardest worker in either house. He never missed a committee meeting. He had a capacity to retain and recall the essential elements of very complicated legislation. He was continually called upon to give advice in many areas of expertise, of his expertise. And anyone who ever wrote to him or visited his office knows that he and his staff did a first-rate job of serving his constituency. Morris reached his peak of leadership and influence when he became chairman of the Senate Subcommittee on Education during the administrations of Kennedy and Johnson. There, though he has never received credit for his accomplishment, he was responsible for overseeing what amounted to a revolution in American education. To give you an indication of Morse's status, 
Here is President Johnson advising a lobbyist on an education bill in the mid-1960s. Look, I want you to talk to Wayne Morse about that. See whether he thinks it's a good idea, because if he doesn't like it, you might as well forget it. With an understated brilliance that astonished those outsiders who knew only his more inflammatory side, Morse steered every new frontier in great society education bill through the Senate. 67 separate pieces of legislation in seven years. Everything from the Head Start, Upward Bound, and Teacher Corps programs to the Higher Education Act, the Vocational Education Act, and in my opinion, the most remarkable piece of all, the Elementary and Secondary Education Act of 1965. ESEA, as it was known, turned the might and money of the federal government for the first time in American history toward helping the millions of school children throughout the nation who had been forced to endure decrepit, overcrowded, unsafe, and ill-equipped classrooms presided over by instructor, instructors grossly underpaid for heroic teaching efforts. Columnist Walter Lippmann described the act as an epic-making advance towards the improvement of American education. I prefer the observation of Senate staffer Stuart McClure, who said, ESEA was the best goddamn thing we did in the 60s. In conducting final hearings for ESEA, Morse was able to limit debate to three days, soundly defeating innumerable amendments aimed at weakening the bill, a feat the New York Times described as a legislative miracle. The bill was reported out by a unanimous committee, extraordinary in those days. Eugene Eidenberg and Roy Morey, who published the definitive study of ESEA, wrote that, the unanimous vote reflects a respect and admiration held for Morris by his colleagues. The public image of Morris is often that of an outcast and a troublemaker. But when he is out of the spotlight of publicity and working with his fellow senators as chairman and colleague, his relations are warm and cordial. In the words of a Southern Democrat, he is regarded as a man of high integrity who is fair, open-minded, honest, and reliable. To show that it wasn't only Democrats who felt that way about Morse, here's Republican Senator Jake Javits of New York describing Morse's work on education. It is extraordinary that a man of so many abilities in so many fields becomes the most adroit, intelligent, wise judge, conciliator, conciliator and friend when he is in charge of a bill that any committee could ever have. It is extraordinary to which Connecticut Democrat Thomas Dodd saw fit to add, the senator from Oregon is one of the great members of this body. When I traveled around the country in the 1980s interviewing people for the biography, the most common observation both from those who admired Morse's maverick ways and those who most assuredly did not was it would be refreshing to have someone like him in the Senate right now. Today, when education has once again fallen into desperate straits, when politicians, local and national, seem unwilling or unable to respond to the crisis in a way that seems to make sense, the need for Morse's kind of effectiveness is greater than ever. Because of his fierce independence, I doubt that Morse, if he were alive in 1998, could get elected to the Senate. But if he were here, and somehow could get elected, I suspect we would all have reason to believe that the problems of American education aren't so hopeless after all, that a maverick leader from Oregon just might provide us grounds to be optimistic about the future. Thank you. Thank you, Mason. It's always a pleasure to revisit uh, those characters in Oregon's history that have given Oregon its identity across the nation as a place for innovation and progressive attitudes. Uh, before I ask my question, I just want to make another plug for Mason's book. 
Um, it is an excellent book. I've been reading it as well as Pete. We each bought our own copy for your information. <laughs> and I would recommend that you buy a copy. It's been published by our own Oregon Historical Society Press. And it is, uh, aside from being very well documented history, the English language has rarely been rendered so well. And if you're a fan of reading good English, this is a good book for you to pick up. My question is, uh, Mason, I, I would like you to tie in your references and study of masterless politicians to the current senators Oregon has in Washington, D.C. On a scale from one to ten, one being uh, a slave to partisan politics, ten being the uh, Wayne Morse model of do your own thing, could you please rate our senators? I think I know better than to uh, get caught in this one. Um, I, how shall I put this? The senator who, who said he would not follow in Wayne Morse's footsteps is your senior senator. Um, I, th I interviewed uh, Senator Wyden uh, as part of the work for this book. Uh, he spent uh, part of his youth in one, one of Morse's latter campaigns, and I think he sees himself in the Morse tradition. But frankly, I don't see really anyone uh, actually uh, functioning in the way that Morse did. I said I thought he would have difficulty getting elected today, and I think uh, it ha would have to do with money. I think uh, people like to believe that when they give the amounts of money, especially the huge amounts that are given these days, that they're buying something for their investment. And Morse was simply not buyable. Uh, he made that very clear from his very first campaign in uh, 1944 when he, was told, he said, the fat, I'm not for sale to the fat cats. And he never was. And I think today, uh, he would have trouble raising sufficient money. So I think I'll beg off answering that question directly. Uh, I, I'll, I, I'll, I guess what I would say, I'd give one of them a six and the other one a four, but I'm not going to say which is which. <laughs> Andrew Kayser, City Club member. We've recently been reviewing the life of Senator Goldwater. I was curious if you could contrast Senator Goldwater and Senator Morris, granted on opposite ends of the political spectrum, but similar in their attitudes about independence and style. There is a similarity between uh, Goldwater and Morris. Um, certainly not an ideological uh, similarity, uh, but there was a, you know, it was mentioned before how Morris could get along, uh, in some respects at least, with people uh, with whom he disagreed. Goldwater was one, although I have to say that uh, Goldwater, uh, on the floor of the Senate at one point, accused Morris of, quote, political thuggery, end quote. Actually, political thuggery was a term that was in vogue in those days. A lot of people were accused of political thuggery. Uh, I'm not quite sure what it meant. but. Uh, uh, but uh, I would contrast them in terms of their ferocious independence. Uh, but I, I, in my own reading, I would find Morris a far more independent person than Goldwater was. I think Goldwater got even more feisty and more independent after he left the Senate, willing to take on his own establishment, for example, in ways that he was not willing to do while he was in the Senate. Charlie Davis, member. Uh, would you uh, summarize the ferocious relationship between Wayne Morris and Dick Newberger? Um, summarize it, <laughs> goodness. Uh, the Morris-Newberger relationship uh, is the longest, constitutes the longest chapter in the book. It's a relationship that lasted 30 years and began when uh, Newberger was a student at the University of Oregon and Morse was dean of the law school. And there were episodes there uh, um, which were very unpleasant for Newberger. And Morse came to his defense. Uh, in one respect, saved Newberger from dishonor 
in another respect, eased him out of the university. And then there was a minor career that Neuberger had as a journalist writing about Morse. And then they were colleagues in the Senate. And uh, one the senior, very much the senior colleague, Morris, very one, one very much the junior colleague, uh, Neuberger, and they got along for perhaps a year. And I think given their history, it was inevitable that they should, uh, that they should end as uh, enemies. And uh, I think I could just characterize it as the most celebrated uh, feud between two members of the same wing of the same political party in American history. Nobody in Oregon at the time really understood what was going on, knew enough about their, their history, their past, to understand why it was so vehement at the present moment. I think it was doomed to have that conclusion. It's t much too complicated, however, to spell it out more for you at this point. Yes? Uh, Ray Polani, a City Club member. Uh, as a relatively young man of 30, when I immigrated into the United States and came into New York, uh, after six months I declared to several of my European, ex-European friends, that I intended to move to the West Coast, to Oregon of all places. And of course I got remarks about Indians and everything else, but somebody said, well, there's got to be something good in Oregon because we have Wayne Morris in the U.S. Senate. Uh, with that aside, my, my question really is, I thought that in your speech at some point you said something like uh, unpredictable uh, about Morris. Uh, do you really think he was unpredictable? In, in my estimation, I think he was very predictable. Uh, he, he was uh, true to his uh, beliefs all the time. and. And, and he didn't hide him, so I, I'm not sure. You, you, you think he was unpredictable? Um, well, let me narrow that definition slightly. I do think he was unpredictable. Um, I, you know, there's a concept in politics of a bankable vote. That is a vote you know you can count on and will go a particular way. Morse's vote was not bankable. And sometimes it, it didn't matter what the issue was. Uh, and that could be civil rights, it could be civil liberties, it, on a rare occasions it could even be on foreign policy. Generally speaking, one knew where more stood on things. Uh, Americans for Democratic Action usually gave him a 100% rating, or at least a 90% rating. Generally speaking, one knew where he stood. But on any particular issue, if he thought, for example, uh, even though it was something he agreed with, that a uh, procedural step had been left out, which in his mind violated constitutional principle, he'd vote against it. Even though he was the only liberal in the Congress voting against it, it didn't matter. And I think in that respect, he was unpredictable. And I think uh, a lot of people had trouble with that. Yes. Uh, Gil Johnson, a City Club member. I worked for Morris since 72. Uh, in fact, my one claim to political fame is running out of gas at a little after midnight while driving Morse from Ben to Portland on top of Mount Hood. <laughs> <clears throat> and uh, I actually did not give, I, I still finished the campaign. <laughs> I've got a couple questions. When I was working, there were legends about Morse, and I haven't gotten all the way through your book, so I haven't caught up with this one. One is that he, um, when he got stuck on the District of Columbia Committee, got complaints from people in the district that everybody and their brother in Congress and their aides were fixing parking tickets. And so he took to reading the names of those people, like congressmen, on the floor of the Senate. Um, that's, that's a, that's, I just want to know if that's substantial. That's a true story. Go. The other thing is, don't you think there is a legacy of Morris? I mean, nobody claims to be a, a Newberger Democrat in Oregon that much. I mean, but, you know, I look around the state and I see people who have Morris's traits, people, uh, you know, who you know, he's, he inspired. I know there's a congressman down in Lane County that looks like a maverick, and there's people in the PUC and in every level of government. I think there is a legacy there that you don't find from any other politician in Oregon except maybe uh, Tom McCall. Well, I'm, first of all, I'm pleased to hear that. I uh, know a little bit about the congressman in uh, Lane County. 
who was uh, active, uh, who has done things with the Wayne Morris Park board people down there. And I think, uh, and I heard him talk, and he, he says, he sees himself in the Wayne Morris tradition. But I also have to say, I don't, I'm really out of touch with Oregon politics. I live in California, and I've lived there for several years now, and I used to make annual peregrinations to Oregon, and I don't anymore, so I really can't confess to any expertise. I, when, I, uh, when I said what I said before, I was referring nationally. I think, uh, and I don't know, I feel that way about the entire uh, Congress, and certainly the Senate. Um, there used to be giants in the Senate. Now, maybe I'm getting to be old and fogeyish and nostalgic, but it seems to me that the caliber in general has degenerated and the sense of independence in, uh, below Morse's level has dissipated. So uh, I don't want to get too maudlin about this, but I, uh, I, it's hard for me to see the, a Wayne Morse uh, on the horizon right now. Yes. Monroe Sweetland, a member of the club. Morse is the product of Wisconsin. Wisconsin, all through the New Deal years and ever since, really, more than any other state, I think, has been the wellspring of liberal and progressive thought and independence. Is, do you think it's an accurate interpretation of the course of American history to say that in Wayne Morse you had personified much of the La Follette tradition, even magnified in many respects? Is that a fair a judgment to make on the course of history as exemplified by Morse? I think I would agree with that. Uh, Morse grew up in a progressive Republican family with the stress on progressive. And uh, when he was in high school and in uh, his early years in college, that was the, the progressive movement was at its uh, full sway and uh, was seen as the Wisconsin was seen as the cradle of democratic reform. And Morse internalized an enormous amount of that. I think he carried it beyond anything La Follette. And I guess you implied that in what you said. Uh, and, but I, I agree with that. I would describe Morse as a, a progressive when he was a Republican, as you know, uh, many of you probably. <clears throat> he never, when he was a Republican, he never voted more than 30% with his own party. And, uh, and he was forever lecturing the Republican Party on why they should be more progressive. And it seemed inevitable that he had to leave that party sooner or later. It's amazing that he lasted uh, eight years uh, in the Senate as a Republican, given his progressive background and given the way he was chafing against uh, their positions on certain things. I might argue a little bit on where, where Morse fit in as a New Dealer. <clears throat> there were parts of the New Deal that he didn't like. Um, he was, government sometimes got too big in Morse's opinion. And uh, he objected to some of those. Yes. I'm Don Sterling, a City Club member. You've almost answered this question that I stood up to ask, but I'll keep going anyway in case you want to add to what you've just said. What were the considerations that caused Wayne Morris, having been elected first with the support of the Republican establishment of Oregon, to move out of the Republican Party and in two steps move into the Democratic Party? <clears throat> there are, there are, it's a complicated issue. Uh, it seems to me ideologically he'd been, he had been moving away out of the uh, Republican Party. <clears throat> he uh, totally uh, disagreed with Senator Robert Taft, the ideological leader of the Republican Party. And when Eisenhower essentially adopted the Taft position in the 52 campaign, Morse had had it. Um, there were also some internal things that had happened in Oregon where Morse was, found himself as a delegate to the 52 convention, a delegate without portfolio. He was given no position on the platform committee. And uh, in fact, he was replaced by a young uh, political scientist from Willamette University named Mark Hatfield. Uh, so there were internal problems, 
But I think the overarching issue was, uh, was resistance to the capitulation of Eisenhower, whom he supported initially with, uh, with great energy, uh, to the Taft wing of the party and the McCarthy wing in the party. And I would add just one other thing to that, and that is that he enormously admired Adlai Stevenson. Thought of, uh, if he had another hero uh, <clears throat> after Bob La Follette, it would have been Adla Adlai Stevenson. He later on was disappointed in Stevenson over Vietnam, but uh, Stevenson was the man he thought could lead the country. I would say for all those reasons. Yes. And Paul Meyer, member of the club. Would you not include among those reasons uh, people like Monroe Sweetland and Howard Morgan, who uh, established a viable Democratic Party in the post war period and therefore enabled uh, Morse to move out of what had been a one party state into uh, the party in which he probably always belonged? Absolutely. I, <clears throat> right. There had to be a Democratic Party for him to move into. And until. Uh, Monroe and Howard uh, got to work after the war. It was a Morbin party, and uh, I don't. It would have been interesting to see what would have happened had that party not been viable. I should also add that uh, Monroe was uh, very effective at badgering Morse in those days to get himself into the Democratic Party where he belonged. So I think there was a kind of personal uh, pressure put on by Monroe and Howard that had something to do with it as well as their institutional effectiveness. Yes. Um, as a political scientist and uh, a resident of California, which has had this uh, extraordinary election, could you comment on uh, Morris's impact and others like him who switch party on <clears throat> the effect on uh, political parties and their stability and strength? Um, I'm not sure I know how to answer that. The, um, and I don't remember how Oregon works now. California went for the first time in a couple of generations to the open primary this year. So you could vote for anybody on either, regardless of how you registered, you could vote for anybody in either party or there were 11 parties altogether. It's California after all. Um, I, I don't know, uh, and incidentally, can somebody tell me, is, what's the situation in Oregon now? Can you, is it open primary? It's not, it's still closed in Oregon. Um, it's open in the Democratic Party, but not the Republican. Oh, that's interesting. <laughs> um, it, it would be hard for me to believe that Morse would have approved of that. Uh, he did believe in party responsibility. On the one hand, I, my guess is that he would have come down in a very ambivalent way. He also believed in ferocious independence. So I guess I can't give you a clearer answer to that. Yes. Dr. Charlie Grossman, I'm a city club member emeritus, and I don't know if I'm entitled to ask a question. Go ahead, Charlie. <laughs> uh, apropos of Monroe Sweetland's remarks, the implication you gave was that Morse's greatness, if that's what you're calling it, was due to his Wisconsin progressive upbringing. And I would like to ask, if not his living in Oregon and being exposed to Oregonians and the fact that most Oregonians, maybe I shouldn't say that, I don't have the data, are not native born, uh, had something to do, because I can remember one specific change in Morse, and that is in 1952, he was in favor of the bombing of North Korea. But a few years later, he changed entirely in terms of his position on war. You may mean the bombing of China. I'm not sure. No. Nor North Korea bombing was. Bombing of the North Korea, uh -huh. 1952. Uh -huh. He was a member of the Armed Services That's Committee, right. a Republican member then. And he would not explain, mm -hmm. other than that he had secret information, why it was necessary. Yeah. I, uh, well, I, <clears throat> I agreed with what Monroe Sweetland said. I would not, however, make a one-to-one -one connection between Wisconsin upbringing and Morse's greatness. I think there, uh, it, would to, it would be to minimize the man uh, to say that. And I say in the book that I think that uh, Morse's, the reception for Morse 
uh, and for others like him. One, one can also say for Hatfield, who after all, as a Republican opposing the Vietnam War, was able to get elected and reelected. Uh, there is something about politics in Oregon which has an openness to it, which allows people like, uh, I don't know if that's still the case, but in those days it certainly was true that it was, uh, it was not a heavily ideological state. And uh, <clears throat> I think fierce independence was prized as much as anything else. That was our guy fighting there in Washington and giving them hell very much in the Harry Truman uh, kind of mode. And in fact, when Morris actually got into a, a, almost got into a fist fight, he came this far, but the sergeant of arms grabbed his, grabbed his arm. He was leaving the Senate, uh, uh, do, going through into the hall, and a fellow senator grabbed him by the throat. Morris was ready to deliver a haymaker, but he never got to do it made headlines in Oregon, and Morse was uh, greatly applauded for taking that kind of feisty stand. Yeah, I, I would attribute it to, there are many factors, Wisconsin, uh, Oregon, and not the least of all, Wayne Morse, and I, one final one, his mother. Thank you for your remarks. We'll have to watch our senators to see whether they move up or down on the scale of four to six. Uh, we'll see you next week for Tony Hobson's presentation here at the Multnomah Club. Thank you.